Okay, well, welcome everyone, classmates and friends. Um, I'm Carolyn Dvorak Nielsen, and I'm your host today. We have an amazing program today featuring Jay Jackson's humanitarian work in Nepal. This is a part of a series of programs leading up to our 50th reunion. We greatly appreciate the support of Nancy Mitchell and the alumni office that makes this possible. As Nancy just told you, this program is being recorded and will be available through the Whitman Alumni Virtual YouTube channel, which you will be able to access from whitman.edu. Uh, Nancy will be sending out an email after this program with uh, that uh, detail as a reminder. We will have time at the end of Jay's program for questions and answers, and at that time, uh, you can unmute yourself. I think we're probably a small enough group that we could probably do that, but uh, we'll also keep an eye on the chat function as well. Now, the roots of this program come from our freshman year at Whitman. Jay and I were both in Anderson Section A. I was from Great Big Seattle, and Jay came from the little eastern Washington town of Grandview. Because we were a close-knit group, working together these many years later has been a treat for both of us. At the same time, for me, and maybe for Jay, Nepal was completely unexpected. How does a girl from Grandview become involved in humanitarian work on the other side of the world? Well, we'll find out today. Jay began her work in Nepal 21 years ago after a trip there with one of her former students. She quickly fell in love with the Nepalese people and has been returning annually ever since. She has an admirable ability to look around her, identify needs, and then proceed to help bring about life altering changes, especially in health and education. She sees needs and gets to work. Close collaboration with local Nepalis and fearlessly asking for donations of goods and services are keys to her success. All of the photos in this program were taken by Jay during her many visits. They will give you a broad portrait of Nepal and Nepali life, as well as illustrate some of Jay's specific projects. So let's begin now by turning this over to Jay. Take it away. Thank you, Carolyn. I'm going to hit uh, share the screen now. I'm going to ask you, because you can multitask, I know, um, to look at the slides and that will give you some information about Nepal and also maybe the pictures will show you what I fell in love with. But for the first 10 slides or so, I'm just going to talk about how I got started. So that won't match the picture. So you will have to, um, as I said, multitask. Okay, so the first year I taught at Bartlett High School in Anchorage, I had a brilliant student in my photography class who told me I'm going to become a doctor, volunteer my time in developing countries and take you with me as my documentary photographer. He became an eye surgeon and 20 years later, he called me at Christmas to say, order your film, send me the bill, we're going to Nepal. He became an eye, uh, yes, over three weeks in 1999, we were in five eye hospitals around the country. I had never seen such poverty or met such wonderful people. I was definitely hooked. Our last meeting at the eye teaching hospital was in a room with a sign over the door. Library, it said. Do you know what was in that room? Tables and chairs. No books, no periodicals, just tables and chairs. Returning home, I immediately set upon Elsevier Science to gift them the top two ophthalmic journals in the US. My homework assignment for my student was to give programs to raise awareness about global eye care and poverty in developing countries. My first program was to a Rotary Club in Girdwood. A Rotarian there said I should ask for something while I was there, but not money, it had to be an item. I wrote the director of the eye teaching hospital asking him to name something he needed for 250, 500 and $750 and I would try to get them. Well, within 48 hours, I had a full blown proposal for $25,000 worth of portable surgical eye equipment for their remote remote and rural eye camps. Boy, the challenge was on. When I finally got him that equipment, I thought, now I am done. Periodicals and surgical equipment, I am done. Lesson learned, number one, once you are successful, they never stop asking. 
It costs <laughs> nothing to ask. And if by some chance you get them what they need, that's a bonus. But I thought they expected success every time. In my ignorance, my next thought was, well, how hard can it be? I can try. That repeated thought has tended to be my downfall every time. It quickly became obvious that in order to get donations from, cor from corporations, I needed a 501c3 nonprofit status. My initial attempts to work with an already existing nonprofit did not work out. They wanted 25 to 40 cents on the dollar for their administration fee. So I found a lawyer and a CPA pro bono to help me with the forms. The last step was to decide if we were going to get less than $10,000 a year in donations or more. It was $125 to apply for $10,000 in donations, but over $10,000 annual, it was 500 to apply. I laughed. I have a healthy fear of the IRS, so I paid the $500. Our first corporate donation was $5.4 million of intraocular lenses for cataract surgery from Bausch & Loam. I was awful glad I'd paid the 500. Lesson learned number two, just because the first person who answers the corporate phone says no, doesn't mean everyone will. Call back. I think I called Bausch and Loam four times before I found somebody that was interested in what I needed. As you will notice, there's a little girl going to the bathroom here. One of the big changes that I have seen in the 20 years I have been there is there are now signs that say no defecation zones. And ones in Nepali that say animals go on the ground, humans use toilets. Just beyond the little girl, you can see a pond and in the lower right hand corner, that's what these ponds look like. They sometimes grow fish in the ponds, but they also wash their clothes, go to the bathroom, mosquitoes breed there and malaria is a big problem. So I could see that I had a, a lot of issues set before me. Nepal is very proud that they have only ever been under a Nepal flag and they have never been uh, taken over by any other country. Two of my first board of director members, and they're still on my board of directors, are Dr. Bhagwan Karela on the left, left and Dr. Shashank Karela on the right. Dr. Shashank was the head of the eye teaching hospital the first time I went there, and he's now a member of parliament. Dr. Bhagwan is the first formally trained heart surgeon in Nepal. He took a shoe factory and turned it into their only national heart center, Gangala National Heart Center. So both of these gentlemen are imperative for our work to vet projects for me, what is the most uh, needed and what we would be the best at doing. But also in Nepal, you have to know people and be introduced by people, especially if you're a foreigner before they accept you. So if either one of these gentlemen gives me an introduction, it has cut through a lot of red tape. Shashank's father was also the first elected prime minister of Nepal, and so he has just been uh, invaluable for contacts and for introductions. Our Nepali uh, volunteers include in the upper left my Nepali sister Sabita, in the middle my Nepali son Sagoon, who was a medical student at the eye center when I first went, then he became the head of retina surgery, and just last week he was appointed the director of the eye teaching hospital. And he has me stay with his family when I go, so I'm really fortunate. The two gentlemen on the right are some Rotarians over there that volunteer with us. Uh, moving down, that Saguna and myself at the Bonapa Eye Center. And they have often asked us for equipment, and we have been able to provide it. In the left-hand corner are some FSNs, Foreign Service Nationals. At one point, I was the uh, admin assistant to the director of USAID, and so I made a lot of good contacts there. Santosh, the guy in the middle, is also on our advisory board, but they do a fundraiser for us each year, and especially at times like the earthquake, they were able to help us get aid out to the uh, rural villages. My former students have also been excellent in being volunteers and supporters. Uh, several of them have established uh, I funds, uh, excuse me, scholarship funds uh, that will send a girl to school every year forever. So I am indebted to them for any time I call and say we're doing this or that, they will come to my aid. Our big fundraiser each year is a thing called Paintings for Nepal, and the art community here has gotten behind us. And each artist donates a original painting, not a print, but an original painting. They hang for two weeks in a silent auction at an art supply place here in Anchorage, and we kick it off with Picnic on the Patio. 
I fix all the food, but I have Rotarians, former students, and all kinds of people that come and grill the burgers and help us out. Um, that's blessing my kitty. He usually attends uh, all public things that I go to, and you'd be surprised what a common is if you have a cat in a stroller with prayer flags on it. And the lower right-hand corner is the Stuvik family. Chris is on my board of directors and as a former student, his daughter, Jessie, asked when she was in elementary school, they said, well, what do you want for your birthday this year? And she had seen a picture of an elementary school over there that just had uh, a bunch of dirt out front and that was their playground. And she said, well, I want equipment, playground equipment for those children in Nepal. And I love when we can impress upon young people that there's always something you can do. So Chris asked me, he said, well, what can we do about this? I said, well, let's have the people coming bring things that they can use that it won't take too much to get it there. And he said, well, like what? I said, like jump ropes and ping pong sets and badminton sets, balls that can be squashed down like basketballs and soccer balls and reinflated there. So that's what she did. And we got the equipment over there. So, and then she got pictures of the kids playing with that uh, equipment. We also facilitate volunteers. Uh, again, everybody pays their own way. We're 100% volunteer. This is Dr. Jack Jacobs, who decades ago revolutionized the NICU here in, in uh, Anchorage, the neonatal intensive care unit. And he has gone twice uh, to teach and to help out in their NICU. I also at this time want to give a big shout out to Bev Questad from our class, because Bev has also been uh, a really good uh, volunteer for Helping Hand. She has gone over and she's an exceptional teacher and she has worked at a local school uh, with teachers there and uh, has helped them out a lot. So thanks a lot, Bev. We work a lot with Rotary over there. The uh, real joy of Rotary is that everybody in the club is a different profession. So wherever we go in the country, whatever the project is, I can hook up with the loader, local Rotary club and somebody there will know how to put in the toilet, put in the water system, who to contact and all of that kind of stuff. The upper left-hand corner, cor corner is Rajib and he is the uh, outgoing district governor. And the right-hand corner is a Rotary Club over there that we work with a lot, New Road City. Below that is Prabal Rana, who is also a Rotarian, but was a former uh, Nepal ambassador to the UK. And in the big picture, we are gifting an autoclave to the National Kidney Center. And that is Santosh on our advisory board, and then two members from my local Rotary Club, uh, Jerry and Diane, and then the US ambassador to Nepal, um, Peter Bodhi. And uh, he came to our gifting ceremony. So that was really a, a highlight for the Nepalis. I've been fortunate several times to ask to speak at the Rotary District Conference, which I'm doing the upper left-hand corner. And that's been a big help because there are over a hundred Rotary clubs in Nepal. And this way, everybody at least heard about Helping Hand for Nepal and kind of knew what I looked like and who I was. <clears throat> we worked with six Rotary clubs in the South in Chitwan. Uh, this uh, particular village had been uh, had a lot of damage done due to flooding, and you can see uh, what their houses look like. So we wanted to help uh, replace those. When we visited the village, of course, the first thing I noticed is none of the kids were in school. And I knew that a little white lady coming once a year and saying you should be in school wasn't going to get me anywhere. So I asked to meet with the Rotary Rat Club for that area, which is the young Rotarians. And I got them to commit to go once a week to this village, two to the kids that were going to school, and to encourage those who weren't going to school uh, to get in school. And so they have taken that on as a project, and that's helped a lot with uh, education. Musahar means people who eat rats. They're uh, a very low caste, and that's the uh, basically the protein source that is available to them. Here you can see the duplexes that we put in, and they did a lot of the labor on them. We included a water pump in the front so that they didn't have to spend hours hauling water. They have um, an outhouse, a toilet out back, which they had no toilets in the entire village uh, before this, and also an area for a kitchen garden where they could grow some vegetables. Before any of this can happen, you have to meet with the people of the village, the six Rotary Clubs, <clears throat> the mayor who is in the pink uh, shawl there, and everybody has to be on the same page. And then also while we're in this area, you can see in the lower right-hand corner, we also do uh, polio vaccinations uh, with Rotary. 
this is a Rotary Club that I work with and we decided to do a visit to Shermatong in the Halambu area and it's way up in the mountains. Um, it's a very bad road, so it takes a full day to get there and, and back, but it's not actually that far in miles. And they hadn't had any help since the earthquake and their homes had been destroyed and they needed some warm uh, clothing and blankets and so on. At one point, everybody in the village was sleeping together with every bit of clothing they had on and they were all piled on top of each other for warmth. In the upper left-hand corner, the lady on the right is Ramella, a good friend, and she was buried in the rubble for four days after that <laughs> earthquake. Uh, and the lower one is uh, Karen, and I was assigned to go get the blankets. So when I tried to go get blankets, um, I couldn't get the price that they thought we should be getting. So Karen said, uh, Didi, I will go with you. We will get the right price. And I said, well, how come I couldn't get it? He said, you're white and foreign. They're not gonna give you the cheap price. So it just happened that the first place we went, she started with a higher price, but Karen started telling her what the blankets were for and where they were going. And as soon as he said Sermatong and the Halambu district, she lit up like a Christmas tree. And she said, I am from Halambu. You can have as many you want at my cost. So uh, it, uh, it pays to have a Nepali with you. These are the ladies of Sermatong. And we did take uh, blankets, warm clothes, biomass stoves, hot water bags, and so on. You always have to have a community meeting. Uh, you have to know somebody in the village before you go, because you have to know how many adults, how many children, how many households, uh, a lot of that information. You can't just show up and say, we have stuff, and then not have enough for everybody. And the women just couldn't quit touching me. And they kept saying, please don't forget us. Please don't forget us. And when we had the group meeting, what I came to know is they had no access to a healthcare post. And the government says that you will never be further than a two day walk from a healthcare post. And they felt that their ladies that were pregnant and birthing uh, needed help. So could I please help them? They'd talk to the Ministry of Health and hadn't gotten anywhere. So I went back to Kathmandu, I went to the Ministry of Health and they said, oh no, there's gotta be one. They got out a map, they couldn't find it. So they said, well, we're sure it's there, but Safe Motherhood is in charge of that uh, area for uh, healthcare and for uh, pregnancy. So uh, go see uh, Safe Motherhood. So we found Safe Motherhood, Dell and I, we went in and had a meeting and the guy said, oh yes, there has to be one there. And he got out his map and then he got out a big magnifying glass. And lo and behold, guess what? He couldn't find it and they didn't have one. So the next trip, we had to make another trip and take him back up there so that he could meet with the community and everybody could decide, yes, there was no health post uh, and they needed one. And so that's why you go in person because that's how you learn those kinds of things. One of the problems that happened after the earthquake was after the first month, the government was letting things in uh, through customs up until then. But after the first month, they decided they should be in charge and they wanted to charge uh, duty on everything, which people really weren't willing to pay. And it was an outrageous amount. And they just confiscated everything. And they wanted to send it out to the villages. Well, the problem with that was there had been no elections for two years. There was no mayor. There was no assembly. There was nothing. So who do you send this uh, all of this aid to and who's going to be responsible for appropriately distributing it. So it just kind of piled up in Kathmandu. So what we were able to do is working with Rotary and the newspaper article on the left is uh, about us working with a group called Zanta. We were able to charter helicopters at a reduced rate and we could fly all of the stuff uh, that people needed up to these villages. And Gorka is the district where the earthquake was. So we went to many villages uh, in that area. And so that's kind of the problem. Bev can tell you a lot of stories about that. Uh, she was trying to get tents uh, out to people. Before I went, I read in the paper that two babies froze to death. And I thought, you know, this is just not acceptable. What could Helping Hand do that is sustainable, that is reusable, and will actually do some good? Well, when I go, even at night, I use a hot water bag. So I thought bi biomass stoves, hot water bags. So I bought 50 of the BioLite uh, 
stoves, biomass stoves. And a biomass stove, if you don't know, burns very hot and very little fuel very quickly. So you can boil a gallon of water in just minutes. But the BioLite stove, in addition to that, that little orange thing fits on the side. And when it gets hot enough, it actually creates electricity and it will recharge a cell phone or a small radio. And so my thinking was that in disasters, if we got these out to the appropriate areas, that they wouldn't be without a cell phone or a radio for communication. So I was able to meet with the community radio stations. They were having a national conference. So I went to that and I said, I've already given out 20 to key schools in rural areas, but I said, I have 30 for the most remote community radio stations. Uh, that you think you can use this. And so they decided who they should go to and we sent the rest of them that way. Then I found in Kathmandu somebody that was just making a basic biomass stove and we bought tons of those. I went to the, the pharmacy by the teaching hospital and I knew this guy that's holding the hot water bag. We couldn't talk to each other, but we knew each other by sight. And Dill, who is my right hand, is the gentleman in the yellow sweater. And I said, Dill, tell him I'm going to be buying hundreds of these. And I want them for his cost plus 25 rupees, which is about 20 cents. And I said, tell him that I appreciate it. And he's going to do this because people should not be freezing to death in his country. And he agreed. So I think the Smallest amount we ever bought was 200 and we bought as many as 500 at a time. We'd just call him a couple of days ahead and he'd have them uh, boxed up and ready for us. Uh, the other gentleman is Arjun who went with us and he's my driver when I'm at the eye teaching hospital. So you can see that I do have a lot of help uh, uh, when I go and people are willing to work with us. The gentleman on the right is Surendra, and we gave him a scholarship to go to the Institute of Forestry. We don't normally do college scholarships, but he's a Dalit from Thompson, is extremely motivated. Uh, the Dalit cast are the ones you may have heard of that are called the untouchables. And he had managed to get himself through 12th grade, which I thought was pretty amazing. And so we did do a scholarship for him to go and get his bachelor's degree at the Institute of Forestry. He has gone on and has got a master's degree and a PhD in Germany and has returned uh, to help his country. And he's married and has a sweet little daughter. So he saw on Facebook, I was in poker and he wrote me and he said, Madam, when we were in Pokhara, he said, my daughter used to play with a little girl and there's something wrong with her skin and her mother can't get a diagnosis. Could you please help her? So I said, okay. And in Nepal, most streets don't have names. And if they have a name, there isn't a street sign to tell you where it is. So you have to know the area of town and the people's names. So you go to that area of town and you just start asking people, do you know where so-and-so lives? So we found them. And the little girl's skin, when she has any pressure on the skin, uh, becomes a, a blister, a very sore spot. And you can see what it looks like here. And um, the mother didn't know what to do for her. She'd taken her to doctors and had gotten no help. The aunt is holding the little girl, and then that's the grandmother and the mother. The father was an alcoholic. He was useless. So Dill said, and I've never figured their relationships out, he said, oh, I have a cousin uncle here in Pokhara. And he is a doctor at the uh, private hospital. I don't know what a cousin uncle is, but he has one. So he called his cousin uncle and uh, explained the problem and uh, said, could you get a uh, dermatologist to meet us? So he called a dermatologist and he came over to the private hospital and he examined the little girl and he said, this is really rare. I've only seen one other case and it was in India. And he reassured the mother she wasn't going to die from it, but there wasn't a cure, but he could give her ointments and medicine that would make her life much more comfortable. And when she's not a little girl and, and falling and hitting things, it, it wouldn't be as bad. And then it turned out his office was only a couple of blocks from where they lived. So he graciously told her she needed more medicine or she had questions to please bring the little girl back and he to his office and he would see her. When I tried to pay the doctor for the visit today and future visits, he just said, no, madam, you have come a long way to help us. And he said, this is the least I can do is to help uh, this little girl. Then we went to Garigama village because one of the optometrists is from there. And he said, uh, Madam, they have no toilets and the school needs uh, toilets. So I said, well, okay. So we went and again, you have to meet with the people in the village, you have to meet with the teachers. So on the left-hand side, we have the, the meeting. 
Uh, the school is only two rooms. There's three teachers. At any given time, there's some over 200 students, and it's either grades one through four or one through six, and there are no toilets anywhere. This is why little girls usually drop out of schools in many developing countries. So we got everything settled at the school, and they said, oh, madam, you must meet with the mayor. Okay, so we went over to meet with the mayor, and I'll tell you, there's nothing like a Nepali grapevine. They just Everybody knows everything. By the time we got there, every ward member was present and they divide their towns into wards and their ward members are like assembly members. So I thought, oh good, I really only want to meet with this mayor. So the mayor gave his blessing for the toilets at Garigama. And of course, you know what happened. Every ward member wanted toilets for his school too. So I said, well, we would do the, the toilets for uh, Garigama and depending on how they went and the help that we got uh, from the village, then we would see about getting them for, uh, for theirs. Another group uh, that are extremely poor people are the Chepangs and this particular village had been on a hillside. The whole village had been uh, wiped out by a mudslide. And so for two or three years now, they've just been squatting makeshift in this forest. And they too wanted, um, toilet so we had to go there first and meet with them you can see us have a a meeting and we did this with the rotary club and uh, everybody was on board that we would buy the porcelain pan and the pipes and and how what a cesspool was and how you did that but they would have to supply the labor and of course they don't have shovels and things so we do buy the tools so um the reason we didn't put in the water spigots there is the river is just right there so it's not a problem for them to get water and uh, in a Musahar village, um, we were able to put in uh, toilets. There's a double one, so that's one for men and one for women. We uh, definitely said there had to be a water spigot. There's a little um, wire thing to hold soap. So we introduced why you wanna wash your hands with soap. And then there's water also to flush the toilet with and to uh, keep it clean. Uh, and again, uh, the villagers have to supply the labor on rare occasion they decline and we give them three chances. We go three years in a row. Do you want this project? Yes or no. And unfortunately, a lot of them already are conditioned that they think some group's going to come in and just give it to them for free. Um, things tend to not have value if you get it for free. So um, that's why we make them uh, work with us if they really want something. Uh, sometimes they take us up on it in the second year, or third year, sometimes they, they never do. But uh, we make them do as much as they can so that they know how the item works and they can repair it. And so they have some pride in having it there. We also give scholarships in village schools only in rural areas, grades one through 10 with 75% going to girls because that's the uh, underserved population. This is Druba who is originally from this village and he goes back several years. He's a Rotarian and he will meet with the children. First, he finds the ones that are not in school but absolutely can't go without a scholarship. Then he has uh, them fill out an application with their parents and he interviews the student and the parent makes his selection and um, they get to go to school. And we ask that they attend and that they pass in order to get a scholarship for the next year. So they know that they have a place in school and they have something to work toward. Um, none of these schools have electricity. It's just whenever the door and the, the windows are open, the natural uh, light comes through and there isn't glass in the windows. I shouldn't call it a window, the, the window opening. Um, oftentimes they meet outside because it's uh, warmer out there. And a rich school will have a blackboard. So lots of them don't even have that. So they'll take a stick and they can practice their letters in the, in the dirt there. They do get a, a formal certificate from the Rotary Club or uh, Heifer Project, whoever we're working with, and I sign it. Uh, when they get that uh, scholarship and they post them in their homes, they're very proud of when they've earned it for the uh, next year. So it's kind of a nice thing to do for them. We also, with Radha Bangla school, school, help publish children's books in that language. You notice there are over 120 languages uh, spoken and there aren't any books in those languages. Uh, so this is a folk tale about a tiger that is published in a, a local language for them. We also work with Encyclopedia Britannica uh, to distribute encyclopedias throughout the country and Radha Bangla helps us place those. It has to be somebody that knows English and can actually um, 
use that encyclopedia. We have everything from picture book encyclopedias for uh, elementary school uh, on up. And uh, English is a required subject in Nepal. It doesn't mean your English teacher knows English, but it is a goal. They can all count one to a hundred and they can all sing the alphabet song. Uh, <laughs> And has two endowments, a medical emergency endowment, which the earned income will provide uh, surgery and care in an emergency if it's a life-saving situation. And then we have an education fund that will uh, spit out scholarships uh, yes. going forever. Um, this is a Musahar Girls Scholarship that we also have down by the Indian border. And they had never had any of their children going to school before. So this is a really big deal. This is are the mothers standing behind their children. They're very shy. And to get the mothers to agree to give the daughter up who won't be helping them in the home during those hours and to get the father to agree to have a daughter educated when from their viewpoint, all the girl needs to know how to do is how to cook and clean and do the things that her mother has done uh, in her married life. So we're really happy to have these six girls uh, in school. And with their project, we included tutoring uh, because nobody at home is going to be able to help them with any homework or if they have a question. Um, so I'm really proud of these girls being able to uh, participate in this. With the Inner Wheel Club of uh, a Rotary Club, this is the women's arm. They meet once a month instead of weekly and they do projects only for women and children. Uh, we did a blanket project and we work with Antidristi, which is an organization that's relatively new. It's only recently that Nepal is recognizing that they have sexually abused children in the country uh, and that there's anything they could do about it. So when somebody is convicted in the court system, then they call my friend Vanita and she comes and gets the, the girl or the girls. And she has two group homes, one in Kathmandu and one in Hatata. She gets no money from the government. She has to raise all the money herself. Um, she has advanced degrees, master's degrees in uh, psychology and sociology and so on, so that she's able to give counseling to the girls she sees they go to school. Helping Hand also helps with the scholarships. Um, and so I asked her one time, I said, well, what could you use besides the scholarship? She said, oh, we would like some blankets. And I said, well, okay, how many do you have and how many do you need? And she said, well, we have none. So we need one for each girl. And I said, well, okay. So um, the Inner Wheel Club provided the blankets and then uh, Helping Hand was able to get them to Hatara, which is a ways from uh, Kathmandu and present them to the girls. And I just love this little girl on the right because she couldn't keep her hands off the blanket. She just couldn't imagine that she was going to have her own blanket and she was just in seventh heaven. The little girl in the lower left-hand corner with the big grin informed me that her name is now Manisha that Vishnu had a very unhappy life and Vishnu doesn't exist anymore. And now she's happy. So she has a new name. Her name is Manisha. Uh, we also do uh, travel grants and things, anything related with uh, scholarships. And when I first went to Nepal, um, there were no optometrists. There was no school of optometry. So uh, Shashank started one at the eye teaching hospital they now have optometrists and they had their first national conference, which would have, um, you know, classes and updating and so on in uh, 2018. And so they wrote me and they said, you know, madam, the ones that went out to the rural areas, they can't afford to come in for this conference. Uh, could help a hand give a travel grant. So we were able to give 10 uh, travel grants so that the optometrists in the outlying areas could come in for this important uh, conference. Another thing that they are uh, concerned about is animal wear welfare, and they are now um, aware of that, as you can see from this little uh, article here that I cut out. In the same Musahar village, we were going around, and this puppy, anytime he hit his leg, would just scream and cry, and so I asked the people, I said, whose dog is this? I knew what they were going to say. They said, it's community dog. That means nobody owns it, and um, I said, well, what's wrong with his leg? Oh, his leg is broken. And I said, is anybody doing anything about it? Oh, no. And I said, uh, the mother has mange. Do you know what mange is? No. And so I pointed to her skin and showed where the mange was. Uh, the guy in the lower left-hand corner, I just was lucky. And the veterinarian for the whole area was there that day. I said, okay, I want medicine uh, for the mange for the mother dog. And I want the puppy's leg to be set. 
And he just laughed at me and he said, you know, she's going to get mange again. I said, yes, but I'm here. This is now. And I'm setting an example. So I said, I want medicine for mange for the mother and I want the puppy's legs set. So he uh, gave it a shot for pain, went off and got the materials, came back and a huge crowd watching all of this go on. And the dog got his, his leg set. And I said, okay, now this dog is going to need a bamboo kennel. It can't race around for about six weeks. So it's something he can move in, but he can't jump up and down and race. So finally, a man raised his hand. He said he would make a bamboo kennel. I said, okay, now we need somebody that agrees to have this kennel by their front door where they can feed the dog and water it and give it some affection, pet it. Oh, they all laughed. They thought that was really funny. I said, no, that's, that's required. And so one lady said, well, she would have the kennel in her yard. And I said, okay, now there's one thing we haven't done for this puppy yet. Do you know what it is? And they thought and thought, nobody could think of what it was. I said, this puppy needs a name. And Dill was interpreting. <laughs> he looked at me and I said, Dill, if something has a name, it has value. Oh, he said. So he told them and they thought, and finally a lady laughed and she said, let's name it Moti. And Dill said, do you know what Moti means? I said, no. He said, it means pearl, something of value. The next day when I'm going into this village, we see a guy and he's got a big stick and he's beating the hoo-ha out of this cow and dragging it by this rope. So I screamed at Dill to stop. I stuck my hand out, palm out. And of course, they don't know what I'm saying, but I'm yelling stop. And I guess talk to the hand works in just about any country. And they stopped in shock. And Dill's translating. And I said, um, you're hurting that cow. If you're mean to it, will, it will be mean to you. And it had laid down and put its chin out uh, on the ground. I never saw a cow lay like that. And so I approached it talking softly and the men were yelling at me, it's gonna kick you, it's gonna bite you. I said, no, it's not. So I petted it and then I ran my hand over its sides and everything. I said, tell them I grew up on the farm. I've been around cattle. There's nothing wrong with this cow. So eventually it, it got up and it was all relaxed and happy. Then the man that owned it started to come around to grab the rope from me. And I said, no, this cow knows you were the one that was mean to it. I said, somebody else will have to lead it. Well, he didn't like that, but one of his friends came and got the rope and they started off. And as they started off, I turned around and I saw that the owner with his stick started to come up from behind and around the, the side of the cow. <laughs> she saw him and she tried to kick him. So I went back and I said, this cow knows who you are. You were mean to it. It will mean to be mean to you. So I said, you have to be nice to animals. And of course, studies show us that men who are cruel to animals are often cruel to their wives and children. So if I go by something like this and I don't stop, then they interpret that, that I'm condoning it. So you have to stop and do something. And that's why it's important to go there to run into those situations. Back in the village and meeting with the women, I came to notice that the goats are all tied to a little stick with about a foot or foot and a half rope and they have no water. It's a hundred degrees or more every single day and every animal is tied up like this. So I have this big group following me and I stopped at this one goat and I told the lady, I said, this goat needs water, please go get it water. Oh no, she said, I give it a cup every morning and every night, it doesn't need water. I said, yes, it does. I'm, I'm not moving from your front yard until you get this goat some water. So she laughed and eventually brought this blue bucket out. And of course, guess what happened? The goat wanted a lot of that water and everybody behind me just went, oh, they were so surprised. So we were trying to teach them all these animals need water. And then is tying them up to a stake. It, it's just horrible. So Dill and I went to the store and we got little things for water and we got wire and little metal rings that would slide along the wire and we showed them how to make a goat run. So Umesh and Dill made the first one so they could see how the goat could have an area to run. And if they put the goat run where there was grass, it would be able to, uh, to eat and so on, but then it needed water and it needed some movement. So um, you never know what you're going to end up teaching there. Uh, we worked with another Rotary Club to get earthquake aid to Basa and the Solo Kumba area that's up by uh, Everest. And we had a group meeting to pack everything in these big sacks that are all sewed up. 
And then we found a builder, Raju, who's in the right-hand side, and he was getting a um, generator to go to that area. Now, the road is way below where the village is, but the villagers can come down and pick things up and take it back up, even though it's a, a long way, and each of these weigh 80 to 85 pounds. So we had everything in these uh, bags, and we had several truckloads, and we loaded this huge truck with all this stuff, and off it went. So then they... Uh, Again, you have to have a contact in the village, know how many adults, children, households, and so on, and when this truck is arriving, so they will come down uh, and get it. So I said to the club, I said, have any of you ever been to a village like that? Well, no. I said, well, don't you think it would be informative and we would learn something if we went? Well, we'd have to go in a helicopter. I said, well, what if we split the cost and we rented two helicopters? Well, they thought that sounded like an adventure, so off we went. And we uh, arrived at a, a pad where they could land just above the village and the whole village came out to meet us. And you can see how beautiful the people are. Most women carry their babies like the lady on the right in a shawl, but I had never seen one carried in a basket like the lady on the left. I thought that was, that was pretty interesting. And of course, when we got down to the village, we had the ceremony, we gave out the blankets and everything. And I'll, I'll tell on myself, one of my, uh, naive moments when I first went to Nepal, I, because I'm 5'3", and I thought, wow, these people genetically must be pr pretty uh, predisposed to being short. Well, after working in Nepal for a long time, I came to know that many of the villages, the people eat one meal a day of roasted maize. That's it. And they save up all year to get a special food for Desai, which is right now, which is like our, our Christmas and a big festival. Do you know what the feast food is? rice. So they eat roasted maize all year long and the feast food is rice. So, and that's nutritionally deficient. That's why they're all so short. So again, we had to have a little ceremony and you can see this lady's pretty happy with uh, her warm blanket. This is an article about a protest that was going on in Bootwall and on a road trip, this was our next stop. We were due to give out a scholarship at an evening ceremony. And as we got close to Bootwall, the army was out there in a huge long line of cars. We were all stopped and told we couldn't go any further. This protest was going on and that they had uh, baseball bats and things and they were smashing car windows and smashing cars and they couldn't allow us to go any further. So we didn't know if we were spending the night in Hotel Suzuki or what we were going to do. But we sat there a long time, finally two hours after dark, the, they said that the protest was done for the day. And we could go on. So we were very late to our appointment, but uh, I was awfully glad Bill had the room with the radio because he said, Madam, they're going to start the protest again tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. And to be out of this district, we need to be on the road by four. So uh, that's another reason he is so terribly useful to me. Another form of protest that some of the doctors do, this gentleman is famous for it and he's highly loved. He's an orthopedic surgeon at the teaching hospital, Dr. KC. And he has done, uh, I think this was his 16th hunger strike uh, that he went on trying to get the government's attention for what was needed in terms of medical care uh, and, and teaching at the teaching hospital. Um, this is from the newspaper just this week in Kathmandu, even though COVID's a big problem, you can see nothing stops to size. So they're all out uh, shopping for their gifts and it's a, it's a pretty, pretty busy time. Although COVID has been a big problem there, we have had two projects we've been able to continue uh, to do to help them. The hospitals don't have enough ventilators and giving them a ventilator won't help because they don't have enough then. Um, uh, trained people to help respiratory therapists to help with the ventilator. So the hospital started asking for high flow nasal cannulas. And it's like that little plastic thing that goes in your nose for air, but it's a warm, moist area air and it pumps more air into you. And so uh, we never give money directly to a person, no matter how good they are. That's just too much of a temptation. That's another reason we work through groups. 
And I have always been there. I know that group, they know me. So they go out and dicker and they get the best price on the medical equipment. And then I get a receipt and they always do a gifting ceremony and we get pictures. So we know that everything has been uh, bought and is being handed over. And then the head people from the hospital and from the Rotary Club are there for the, the handing out of the equipment. Um, and so these are for COVID patients and we have given out uh, a number of them by request to hospitals. Um, Villages are normally um, food insecure anyway in Nepal, but during the lockdown, they couldn't even have their weekly markets or anything. And they're normally 350,000 tons short of food per year, but during COVID, it's been really difficult. So we uh, worked with the Rotary Club of Dong and they would buy in bulk food and then they would repackage it into enough uh, estimated for a family of four for a week. And then again, you have to have somebody in the village that you're in contact with and know how many households, how many people, so on and so forth. So they were able to do all of that for us. And then they had to apply to the government for permission to have a vehicle on the road, one person in it, the day they were gonna go and they could only go from point A to point B, the village has to know when you're coming so that they can come out of the hills with their little, um, their little cone shaped baskets and uh, pick up the food. And I love this lady because I'd never seen anybody attach an umbrella to it before to shade her from the a son, I thought that was, uh, you know, pretty clever. Uh, we asked them to the Rotary Club to please target pregnant and lactating women uh, because to be uh, food insufficient as well as nutritionally insufficient at that time in your life is, is pretty awful. So we were able to get uh, food nutrition uh, to those women. Uh, this is a list of some of our, our uh, partners that we work with uh, in Nepal. And I've been very fortunate uh, and getting them together. I'm sorry we had such a, a slow start and I hope that you've enjoyed this program. Okay, thank you very much, Jay. Oh, you can see on this uh, screen here that uh, if you wanna know more that uh, Jay has a Facebook page and you can, um, you can find that. So I want to, uh, move on to questions and answers now. Um, so I think we need to get Jay for you to, uh, okay, now, now you're not sharing your screen, that's, that's good. <laughs> so uh, I think we can go ahead and let everybody unmute now. And uh, I think I'll, I'll start off with a question and then of, of course, uh, anybody else who has a question can, uh, can pose their own. Um, there's, I've had the, the benefit of, of hearing this presentation twice and uh, with both times, I'm just uh, astonished and amazed at what Jay has been able to accomplish. But one of the things I've wondered about is uh, what do the Nepalis ask you about your life in America? And, and from that, what has surprised them the most? And of course, the corollary is what has surprised you the most about Nepal? Okay, I'm going to assume that we have all uh, bonded because I would normally never say this in a group situation, but I'm going to tell <laughs> tell you a, a quick little story. At the eye teaching hospital, of course, women don't travel alone. They always have a man with them, whether it's their brother or their husband or whatever. And especially if you're in a village, you're never outside of the village. So the fact that I, I hadn't thought about it before, but the fact that I traveled from Alaska all the way to Nepal by myself is just beyond their comprehension totally. <laughs> So um, in the early years, I literally stayed in the eye teaching hospital and I got to know the residents really well. And after a couple of years, some of the, the females took me aside and they just couldn't contain their curiosity anymore. And they said, uh, Madam, you always say we can ask any question that we want. And I said, yes. And they said, you're sure we can ask any question? I said, yes. And they said, are you gay? <laughs> <laughs> The only thing in their culture that would make sense that would allow me to be single and travel alone, not a guy, a husband or whatever, was if I was gay. So that's what they had figured out must be what allowed me to do this. And I said, 
No, I said in the U.S., I said women can, you know, can travel alone. And there are a lot of single women, uh, you know, my age and so on. And I said, no, we can, you know, we can do that. So I thought that was that was pretty um, interesting. And then sometimes you're in the middle of nowhere and you just think, well, they can't possibly know anything about the the real world. And I was at this eye camp and Helping Hand had provided all the interocular lenses. And while they were doing that, um, I uh, went out to visit some of the little nearby villages and I had an interpreter with me. And this little grizzled man came up. I, I guess I like anything that's a baby. And he had the cutest little baby goat. It was only a couple of days old. And uh, he handed it over to me. And my interpreter said, um, Madam, he wants to give you this coat, goat to thank you for bringing this eye camp and all of the, the lenses and everything that you have provided. And he said, you know, to not accept this is... Um, really a, a bad thing because you'll hurt his feelings and it'll it'll be awful I said well, what am I going to do with a goat and how would I <laughs> get it back to Campman do so I thought a minute and I said tell the man that I really appreciate this gift I am just so honored but I said uh, tell him that I need his help I need him to help take care of this goat for me because I live very far away and I have to get in an airplane uh, to go home. So will he help me and take care of this goat? So he translated and the guy looked confused for a minute. And then he started talking again. And the translator says, the man says he knew a man, man one time that had a dog that was bigger than this goat. And he took the dog on the airplane. So why did he take the goat? <laughs> now, how would he know that? <laughs> I, I don't know. So, um, I get, you know, a lot of things surprised me. I didn't, um, I didn't honestly, I'll show my ignorance. I did not honestly know the difference uh, here. Poverty is poverty. I don't know the difference between absolute poverty and relative poverty. In this country, we have relative poverty. We have a poverty line. It means you're living below the average standard of living for Americans. In Nepal, it's absolute poverty. If you're living in poverty, it means you do not have food, shelter, and clothing to keep yourself alive. Um, at one time when I uh, was there, it wasn't even measured in dollars. If you had 1,500 calories to eat a day, you were not living in poverty. It didn't matter if you had a house, didn't matter if you had a coat, didn't matter if you had shoes. If you had 1,500 calories to eat a day, you were not considered living in poverty. So, I mean, I have, I've had a huge learning curve here. Huge, 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 huge. So, I mean, all of those things surprise me. You go over thinking, oh, well, you know, I read the newspaper, I see photos, I know what poverty is. Well, until you experience it, uh, oftentimes you don't. And I just hadn't ever been to any place like that. But you know what? what surprised me? And I told Santosh one time, I said, it's really confusing to Westerners. I said, we go to these villages and everybody's smiling and they look so happy. And I said, it, it takes a minute for you to realize how they're living, but they look so happy. He looked at me and he said, well, Jay, if we were upset about the way we're living or we didn't have enough food and we were all grumpy about it, he said, would we be any better off? I said, well, no. <laughs> And he said, so we look at it. If we have food on the table for today and none of our children are sick, life is good. And it's that simple. You worry about the food for tomorrow. The next day, you don't worry about it today. And he said, we take joy in our families and they really do. And um, they live in the moment. So if you have food today and your children are healthy, you're happy. Okay, we have a question from the chat uh, from someone who would is interested to uh, know about uh, how they can support your programs, uh, you know, volunteering or, or other means. Okay, well, just, you know, just write to me. And if you want to volunteer, we can set up a volunteer uh, opportunity for you. If you want to set up an ongoing uh, scholarship, believe this or not, it's $50 a year to keep a girl in school. 
That's all it is. And so for a thousand dollar name scholarship, which a lot of people do, uh, it throws enough off in income that it will send a girl to school forever. And your next question is probably, do I plan to be as old as Methuselah and run this forever? And the answer is no. Although I have had a discussion with God that the medical emergency <laughs> has to be funded before I can die. And I don't know if that's going to happen or not. But, uh, we are in discussions with Heifer Project International, and we have worked with them in Nepal for 20 years now. We do a lot of our scholarships through them. And uh, you know what a legacy gift is when you leave something from your estate. Well, when you close out a nonprofit, you have to give everything that you have to another nonprofit. So we want to do a legacy gift. Everything that uh, Helping Hand has will go to a Helping Hand for Nepal fund within uh, Heifer Project International, and, and they would take care of the education endowment and the medical emergency endowment. So it will continue to go on. Um, and so that's how we do that. And so Gosh, donate. Yeah. <laughs> a, a lot of you have, and I, I do thank you. But if you have a, a profession or something that you would like to go uh, have an experience uh, there, we would be happy to try to set that up for you. Or, you know, just write me, call me, email me, message me on, on uh, Facebook, whatever. Uh, and uh, we'd love to hear from you. Okay. Um, anybody else? Other questions? Just, just start talking. Well, I'm, I'm just going to pass on to Jay. Uh, Claire says hello and uh, hopes you're doing well. All right, thanks. Claire, by the way, is a former student of Jim's, and he introduced her to me, and she has done volunteer work uh, in Nepal. So it is truly a small world. So thank you, Jim. Jay, I remember we talked at the last reunion about your work, but did I miss why it was Nepal that you endeavored to help? It's because my former student took me there as the photographer on his humanitarian mission. Okay, I guess I missed that. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> the very first year I taught school, I had this brilliant kid, really the most brilliant I had in my whole career. And imagine a high school senior telling you that. I'm going to become a doctor and donate my time in developing countries, and I'm going to take you to take pictures. I thought, oh, yeah, right. Well, he did become an eye surgeon. And 20 years later, when he calls me at Christmas, he said, okay, I'm ready now. I said, okay, for what? He said, I'm going to go to Nepal, and I need you to be do the pictures, order your film, send me the bill. We'll be going in March. Bye. <laughs> so uh, it, it was Nepal, and Others from that uh, trip have worked in other countries, but as I said, I just, I fell in love with the people and it just, it just snowballed. Yeah. I yeah. really did think I was done after each project, you know, and they kept asking and I'd been there and I knew what the, the issues were. And, uh, you know, I don't know what the universe was thinking because I had no training in any of this. I, the first time I met Bhagwan, he said, you want to come shoot uh, an open heart surgery on Monday? <laughs> nice. <laughs> well, of course I said yes. And then I prayed all weekend. I wouldn't throw up when I saw it. <laughs> he was doing a valve replacement and in the middle of the surgery he says jay come over and take a picture of this valve before and after i want to use it as a teaching thing so here i am i'm not totally um uh, you know sanitized and everything i thought oh, please don't let me drop this camera in this man's chest cavity and so i went over <laughs> and took the picture before and after and then he pictures and his his lectures uh you just have so many experiences that you wouldn't have you know anywhere else and i think sometimes if you're just open to possibilities things come along in life and just say yes and go with it i certainly never saw myself doing anything like this uh, that brings a, a follow-up question actually to what you just said um so you've done a lot of different things. It's just, uh, I guess that's the liberal arts education in action. Um, but are there projects that you wish you could undertake but haven't been able to yet? Um, yes. Okay, obviously I want the medical emergency endowment funded. That's my, my biggest uh, worry. But um, 
I want to do women's empowerment. We do a lot of different things with women's empowerment. And I have come across a group over there that will train women on how to be entrepreneurs. And one of the things that happens is a well-meaning group will go in and they'll think, well, we'll teach these women how to sew and then they can make some money. Well, they go in and they teach them how to sew and then they leave. They don't own a sewing machine. They don't know how to start a business. They don't know how much to charge for what they've made. They don't know how to price in what the material cost and the thread. And so finally it dawned on me, they don't need to learn another skill. They need to learn how to be an entrepreneur, how to have a business. And so there is an organization that will teach women to do that. And the reason they're successful is every single week for two years, they meet with those women they go over what it is they're selling, what worked, what didn't work, and they get training and update after the initial training. And they are uh, carried along for two years with information and mentoring. And after two years, they have a fully successful business and they have to train another woman how to do that. So we can train 100 women over the course of two years um, for $200,000. And Helping Hand always puts in 10% of whatever the project is. So we've been trying to uh, raise money or get a rotary grant or do something. And uh, I did ask the group that, were, that do, offers this, I said, can we uh, train less women and get it down to uh, $100,000? And so we've, we've got that also. But I would love to do that in the far west. Kathmandu is not in the middle of the country. It's easterly. And they ha have an area they call the West. And then there's the far West. And nobody goes there. And there isn't much education or anything. And if those women could have entrepreneurial training, it would really be wonderful. And what's happened in the past is a group will go in and give how to grow vegetables or something. And the women all love to go. I learned this. And their husbands are thrilled to have them go. You know why? The women want to go because they get three meals a day while they are at this training, which they don't have at home. They get to see all their women and have a chit chat, which they don't get to do at home. And then they get a, a fancy certificate to put up in the home, which they're very proud of. And they are paid now to go to this training. And when they go home, they have to turn the money over to the husband. So that's why they like to go. I don't honestly believe in paying somebody to go to a training. It has created a situation where they just do it for those reasons, food, getting to see the other women and the money rather than um, doing anything with the skill they learned, but also they don't have the entrepreneurial skills to know how to do anything with that. So um, I think if we could help them uh, learn how to have a business and the same as the heifer project thing where the the knowledge is carried on from one person to another that that would be really helpful uh, in the far west because they don't get much out there that's also where the maoist uprising started when they had the civil war and it was because of the extreme poverty in that area so carolyn, those carolyn could i ask jay a question at this point is that okay um actually you want it through uh, chat? I have one out of the chat from Norm, okay. and we'll put you next, okay? Okay, okay. Um, and and Norm, go ahead and uh, if you could rephrase if if you wish. But uh, Norm's question was about: uh, Do you have a an idea about how much money you've raised to date, and also the number of people that you've touched? And he also asked about you know how you could help. I think you you'd uh, mentioned that earlier. Norm, norm, norm. <laughs> <laughs> the beginning to keep track. I know that's important. And people ask me, what do you do all day? You know, and they think I only work when I'm in Nepal, but you look at running boys and girls club or anything else, only I don't have a staff and that's what I do. The correspondence and everything and getting this organized is just incredible. So in the beginning, I kept track of how much uh, we were spending uh -huh we did, but it just got to be cumbersome. This is, we're on our 22nd year now. And uh, the last time I had that question, uh, he said, do you think you've gotten over $50,000? And I said, well, our first donation was $5.4 million in interocular lenses. So I know we've got <laughs> at least that much. And then we got $25,000 worth of medical equipment. So I'm sorry, I really don't know uh, how much. And 
how can you say how many lives you've touched? Just like the whole point of breaking the cycle of poverty is when you get a girl to go to school, and I'm sorry, I don't mean to be sexless, but studies show this out. When you put a boy in school, he pretty much sends his sons to school and that's it. You haven't really broken that cycle for the, the whole group. When you send a girl's school, when she gets married, she makes sure all of her children go to school and it just goes down generation after generation. And so how can you say how many people, you know, you touched? Uh, you know that you've broken the cycle in a number of times, but how do you know uh, how many people that eventually uh, went on and helped? And that's why we're so big on sustainability. We want to do things that will carry on uh, and that they learn something from. Uh, I've seen uh, villages where they've put in a, a water system and they didn't require the villagers to help. They don't know anything about it. And the first time a PCV pipe cracks or breaks, <laughs> When we show up, they say, what is this thing and how do we fix it? And you go over and you look at it and they've put some leaves on it or a little mud or something and it's still, leaking. you know, um, to me, that's not sustainable they need to help and they need to know what it is and how to, you know, how to fix it. And uh, Norm, I would love to have you come volunteer if you want. <laughs> tell you an, another big thing is I do a lot of public speaking. I don't usually have this kind of problem with the, the Zoom part of it, so I apologize, but a lot of it is networking and educating people about what they can do and what the problem is. So if you belong to a group or you want to have a program on a specific uh, area and subject about Nepal, I covered a lot of different areas that we work in, and um, you know I can be much more specific on a on a specific, uh, you know, area, but uh, really it's limitless on what can be done. And now that people are used to Zoom, if there's a group that wants, um, wants help or wants knowledge in a specific area, we can even set up a Zoom meeting where you can talk and, and instruct, find out what they're doing, what their issue is, and then give them some information that pretty much exists only in the cities because in the villages, they don't have this type of thing, but people can come in. I mean, um, there's all kinds of things, you know, that can be done. And I used to hate to talk about money, but Nancy will tell you this, nothing happens without it, does it? We try, we try to do it as possible. I pay my own way. I pay all of my own expenses. All of our volunteers pay their own way and all of their expenses. 100% of every donation goes only for the project. Okay, Bill, yeah. you had a question. Amazing. Well, this was leading right into what I was going to ask because during this time of COVID, uh, Jay, it's not safe for you to go over there. And so this is a grand opportunity to be doing fundraising through Zoom. Jay once um, came down to, I live in Vancouver, Washington. So she came and she spoke at my church and we sold uh, purses that were made in Nepal. And that was a way to get, we didn't sell them. Oh, for donations, you got one of these distinct Nepali purses. And um, she gave a PowerPoint similar to the one she gave us um, during the adult worship uh, time. And then um, she just called up different, uh, was it Lions Clubs, Jay? Or Rotary? Rotary. Okay, different Rotary Clubs in the area and um, volunteered to speak at their next meeting, which was that week. And so she made really good use of her time, but now she can do it on Zoom. So she doesn't even need to go anywhere. So I think churches are interested and uh, Rotary Clubs and any other organization you might think of. It um, can even be a group of your 10 best friends. It doesn't even have to be an organized thing. Some group that you think would be interested uh, in Nepal. I often get asked, I, I threw out this $50 a year. That's the average to educate a girl in a village school, I will say, uh, but our endowment for the medical emergency uh, fund is only a million dollars. And that's, as Nancy will tell you, it's a tiny, tiny endowment. But let me tell you, it's a hard sell because if you give 
a thousand dollars to educate a girl every year, people can say, wow, every year I'm educating a girl and it goes on and that's great. If you give a thousand dollars to medical emergency endowment, they look at that as just a drop in the bucket and it's not enough. And then the other half of that is people say, well, how much do you think you might get off that a, a year on an average is good years and bad years? And I said, I expect it to average 50 or $55,000. Well, what can you possibly do medically for only 50 or $55,000? Well, we can do a pediatric heart surgery, the follow-up and everything for $1,200. Oh, my goodness. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just- a different it's, scale. A totally different scale, totally different scale. Sometimes it's just a matter of getting a person from where they are in the country into a city. Sometimes there are other groups we can partner with that will pay for the surgery, but we're one of the few groups, actually only one that I know of, that will pay to get the patient from the rural area into town. Well, if you can't get to where the help is, what good is it that there's somebody there that will do it, you know? I've, we've never paid over $200 to get somebody from a really rural remote area into, uh, into Kathmandu or into uh, Duran or one of these other cities where there's a, a hospital hospital. So, Norm, did I answer your question? Yes, and I, I hope you heard my response, which was, you're amazing. Oh, thank you. You know, it's I not. It's not rocket science. I, I'm exhausted just listening to all the things you've done. Well, I had 21 years to do it. Yeah. <laughs> wow. No excuse. <laughs> That's okay, great. Uh, Other questions? Other questions? I have another question about um, the funds that would go towards helping to educate girls. And uh, you said, um, to put them into a village school, that that $50 would help. What about all those areas where um, there may be three teachers? I mean, where the, there really isn't the infrastructure for a school. So I'm wondering if you can kind of walk us through actually where the money goes, how it um, pays for the education, and then what do you do to overcome the cultural attitudes that, um, you know, especially among the men that, that would resist educating girls. Right. Um, the reason I wanted to be sure and say that it was a rural village school is because sometimes people say, well, if you really love those children, you would take them out of the village and put them in a private school in Kathmandu and give them a, a really good education. Well, I would never do that because you're taking them away from their home and their family and they'll never go back to the village. Eventually you want the village to thrive and, and to come into the real world and do better. And so um, I guess my basic goals, I want them to be able to read and write to do some basic uh, math and so on. And no, the village school may not be the best school in the world, but they will come out with a rudimentary uh, education and look at the optometrist that went to that Garigama village school. That's where he went. And now he's an optometrist. He's a doctor. Mm -hmm. So uh, if they're motivated, you know, it is possible. Um, another thing that has helped a lot is um, Peace Corps was there when I first uh, started and then it was taken out because of the Maoists. Uh, civil war and it wasn't considered safe for them anymore. And we used to send uh, books by request if there was a Peace Corps uh, volunteer in a village and they wanted a set of uh, plays for second grade level or whatever, you know, we would send them to camp and do to the main office and they would come in and, and get them. And when they took Peace Corps out, I was just sick and I thought I'll never see them there again in my lifetime while well, they're back. And so it's really helpful when the villages have a Peace Corps volunteer that works with the teachers mm -hmm. uh, and the schools. And that's another way. Um, most areas have an access to a school of some sort. Lots of them don't go beyond the eighth grade. But in Nepal, it's the same in Australia. Most people only go through grade 10 and you only go to 11 and 12 if you're going to college. So our goal is to get them through grade 10 
uh, because that's an expectation in the country and that's so much more than having uh, nothing. By working with organizations in the country, they do the hard work on getting the men to see that being educated is important. And those Musahar villages, there's an organization there called BOR, B-H-O-R-E, and each of those letters stands for something in Nepali, but they're really pro-education. Of course, they're all Nepalis, and some of them are Musahar that have managed to get an education. And so they're the same people. They go in and they say, look what can happen if you have an education and, the, and your health will be better and you'll have a better job and your whole, your whole life will improve. You know, and so those are the people that that can encourage them. I go and I try too, but I said, let's face it, uh, you know, a little white female from the U.S. isn't going to, you know, you do have input. Uh, it impresses them if you stop and help a dog or you give give value to the cow or whatever, because they haven't looked at it that way. I do think that that's important, but um, you know, getting over the education hurdle, they have to hear it more than once. So having somebody there that says, look, I'm Musahar, I got a high school education or I went to college and this is how my life has changed. This is what I've been able to do for my parents uh, and so on. That's how you get over that hurdle. And it would be so much easier if you could just name one thing, do it across the country and be done with it. But I have learned that life doesn't work like that. Sometimes you have to do it in little increments and in little areas and hope that that ripple spreads out and touches and touches and touches. Right. That's how I have to look at it. And it seems to, I don't know. Okay, uh, do we have other questions? Carolyn? Yeah? Jay? I'd like to know if you've run into any significant political back, uh, backsplash against what you're doing uh, from the Nepalis, or, and if you have, was it overcome or did you circumvent by being very creative? Thank you for that question. And I will say we have been very fortunate and the answer is no, and I'll tell you why. Super. Everything is done over there by uh, greasing somebody's palm. And for years, people would tell me, oh, Jay, you could get this done so much easier and quicker if you would just, you know, mm -hmm. listen, it might be the local politicians or, or whatever. And I have said, no, we don't condone that. We try to mirror uh, the values that we think should be happening. And so everybody knows now you don't ask helping hand anybody for a you know, for any money, because it's not, it's not going to happen. And so they respect us for having values. Another thing is, is the two gentlemen we started with, the eye doctor and the heart doctor, they are so respected that um, nobody would ever think of giving us a hard time. If I was someplace and they didn't have any idea who I was, I might be, but I always have a uh, deal with me. Um, I'll just give you one example. You wouldn't see this in this country, but I was in a village one time with uh, Shashank and this man had a medallion on it. it was triangle in shape. And at the top of the triangle was a picture of Shiva. And in one of the other triangle corners was a picture of Shashank's father, the first elected prime minister. And in the other corner was a picture of Shashank. And it's not unheard of for people to just drop to their feet, knees and kiss his feet. So I was so lucky that uh, he is so revered and so is, is Bhagwan that if they call up somebody and say this woman is coming and da 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 da, nobody gives me a hard time. That's all, just opens doors and um, you know your integrity is never is never questioned. And we don't do anything political. No, if I the, figured you weren't doing anything political. It's just I was wondering if you right were, right how you overcame it. But they see that we do for Maoist, the same as we do for Nepali Congress, the same as we do for any political party. To us, you're all Nepalis. And they've noticed that now. So we don't get, and if we get asked, uh, you know, what do you think of this or that politically? I just always say, I don't have an opinion on that. I'm here to help in education or medicine or whatever it is that we're doing. And we just don't do it. It does take a while for them to know that. But I honestly believe that having the introductions from those two men, even though I didn't know it at the time, that that's what really got us over the hurdle. Mm -hmm. 
I am really the last person on earth that should be accepted in doing this. It's still uh, to a large degree, a male hierarchy, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I don't speak the language and uh, I'm not even Hindu for gosh sakes, you know, I don't, I don't take any <laughs> white box, but, um, but they're, they're accepting. And when they, I said their, their pipeline for gossip is unbelievable. Uh, when you finally are known that you are, you are just really there to do good and not support a political party, or you could care less that if they're in need and they're Nepali, uh, they're on our radar screen. So I have been very lucky that way. And thank you for that question. I appreciate it. I figured there was something of uh, incredible luck and value that you touched and, and was able to sidestep an awful lot of grief. Yep. I didn't even know I was doing it in the beginning because yes. I didn't know who these men were. Well, actually, that's the freedom of being who you are. I guess. <laughs> yeah. You didn't have, you know, it, as much as it might have been one uh, valuable to be Hindu, by not being Hindu or anything, it meant that multiple um, villages or organizations could talk to you. Yeah. We've never pushed Christianity. We've never... Nope. Uh, anything. It's that we just stay focused on the, the humanitarian aid mm -hmm. or development. And I think that has really seen us well. If we're asked, I will certainly answer the question, you know, madam, what religion are you? I will answer it. Mm -hmm. but, uh, in fact, it's against the religion, against the law in Nepal to proselytize or push a religion. Well, we should do that here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh boy. Anybody mm -hmm. else? Yeah, I think we've had a fascinating time. I know that Jay, since you've been busy with the presentation, uh, you haven't been able to monitor the chat, but you are getting uh, many, many, many compliments for your integrity, for your devoted work, for your, uh, your diligence, and well, just right. your... Uh, reaching out to make the world a better place? Well, you know, I came from a family, my parents always felt everybody should do something to help. If the best you can do is with your neighbor, you help your neighbor. If you can help your community, you help your community. If you help your state, you help your state. If you help the country, you help your, uh, your, your country. And um, I felt that women, uh, broaden my scope of, of thinking and that no is an ever an answer and nothing's impossible that you just, uh, you know, you just try. And so I have just uh, gone with that. I'll end with one quick thing that um, after I had been over there the first time that the head of this eye teaching hospital, Dr. Corella wrote me and invited me to come back as a volunteer. And I thought, oh my God, he doesn't remember which one I am. He probably thinks I'm one of the nurses. <laughs> what could I do at an eye teaching hospital? You know, the little high school <laughs> model teacher? I don't think so. And, um, and then I realized, well, he probably doesn't know how to rescind this invitation and how can he save face and he'll be embarrassed. So like any little good American, I sent him my resume. Because isn't that a <laughs> resume? So I didn't hear from him. So finally, I called him up and it was $4 a minute at that time. And I said, uh, well, did you get my resume? And he said, yes. And I said, well, and he said, well, what? I said, I sent that to you because you asked me to come volunteer and I thought you were confused and I'm not medical anything. I said, you didn't know anything about me. And he just started laughing. He said, I don't know anything about you. He said, you've gotten us $25,000 worth of medical equipment. I know you can follow through on things. I know you pay. <laughs> and I know you have a college degree because you're, you're a teacher. I know you must make a huge impression because your student brought you over here after 20 years from hand. He just went through this whole list of things that he knew about me. And I thought, oh, that is so refreshing because here you can't even get an interview or something. If you can't get past the, you know, the resume and over there, if there's a problem, if you just notice you're already a success, if you're successful in getting something that really is icing on the cake. But to them, if you just notice, they are so happy if you notice and try. 
So I think we've been uh, doing this for a little over an hour and a half now. Oh, and, and, and no, that's good. <laughs> and unless somebody has any burning questions, it's probably about time to wrap this up. It, it's been uh, for me a, an enormous pleasure to be involved in bringing this program to you. Uh, and for, uh, for me, as I started out at the beginning, uh, you know, how it all goes back to freshman year and it, it's uh, what, what a treat it's been to sort, to sort of, uh, you know, have a friendship kind of on hold for a few decades and then just pick right up where you left off. Um, now, I think I could say that about every one of you. So um, I'll make a plug here to see you next June at our reunion. Yeah. Um, and and everybody everybody needs to be there um, because uh, we are a fine bunch of people and we bring out the best in each other. Um, There's so uh, that shared history that is really special. So I hope you all will uh, try to come. And Valerie, it's so nice to see you and Janet and mm -hmm. uh, a lot of you guys that I haven't seen in a really long time. So uh, thank you so much for for joining us. Yes, and thanks to everyone who's participated, asked questions, put things in the chat. Um, and as we said at the top, uh, this will be posted on the Whitman's uh, virtual web, virtual YouTube channel. And uh, I ran through yesterday and uh, it is possible to figure it out. Uh, there's at the top of the page, it says alumni in little tiny letters. You click that and you get to a big button which uh, gets you to virtual Whitman. And then you click that and that gets you to alumni virtual events. You go down the list and you find your program that you wanna see. Um, all of the things that have been um, uh, presented during this past year are up on that website. So if you miss something or wanna see something again, it's there for you. So uh, again, thank you all for participating. Thanks especially to Jay for her good work and for her willingness to share it to us. Yay, Jay! Thank you so much. And, and, and again, I'd like to just give kudos to Nancy Mitchell. She yeah. has yes. done yes, a yes. phenomenal Love amount, it. particularly during COVID, to help get all of these things organized. It's kept me sane to be able to attend <laughs> a lot of her good. programming. Good. And, it's and kept me sane too. <laughs> <laughs> Jay Jackson, of course, a lot goes to you. Thank you. And I, I thank you too, right. Nancy. These You're programs welcome. have been wonderful. There have been a number of them. So if you've missed them, they are recorded and you mm -hmm. can go and go back and see them. And they've been great. And of course, it's a way to share them with you know friends and family and anybody who you think might be interested. I appreciate everybody. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Jay. You. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye. <laughs> Bye.